we are about to interview one of the most popular motivated speakers that there is on this earth. And he's an incredible icon. And I am going to throw it over to Chris Sorby to give the pleasure of introducing our icon today. Chris. So this wonderful man is an author. He's a motivational speaker. He's the dean, co-founder, and co-owner of the Paul Mitchell Schools. And we are so grateful to have Wynn Claybar in the room with us. Welcome, Wynn. Thank Woo! you. Thank oh you. my gosh, thank, thank you both so, so much. Uh, I mean, do you hear that word um, icon? I always thought that you had to be a hairdresser. You had to have the artistic side of your career to be called an icon. And um, the, the cool thing about the beauty industry is that even without that license that hairdressers have, there's so many great things that we can do in the beauty industry. So I'm, I'm humbled and I'm honored to be on your list. Oh, yeah. thank you. And Glad I have to have you. As you are an author, I'm going to ask you, what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, gratitude. Because, uh, you know, when, when times are, are, are tough, and Lord knows many people have it worse off than, than others, um, what gets me through this, and we all need to get through it, we all have our stories to tell, and our stories are real for us. Uh, just because somebody has it worse off doesn't mean that the pain and the, the, the challenges that we're going through don't have value or don't have an impact on our lives. And so what kind of gets me through all of that is, is gratitude. I just have to keep my, my mindset and my heart in that, that realm of just being grateful for what I do have. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. I, I want to interject, Chris, can I? Of course. When um, age is irrelevant, but let's go way back to the beginning. Like what really motivated and drove you? Like, I don't know your schooling. Share with me your schooling. Did you go to college? Did you have a master's in something that it never worked? Or then you went the other way that your soul was telling you? No, not, not one day of college. I barely, and I mean barely, graduated from high school. Apparently, they want you to show up. <laughs> I, I was busy. I told them I was busy. Um, yeah, not, not one day of college. I, I had another career, a short-lived career, but I was successful in that. And all of a sudden, I had this money that I wanted to invest in some type of a business. And I had friends that were hairdressers, and they talked me into opening up a little salon. It was a three-chair salon. It was in the basement of this office building. Um, but I fell in love with the hair industry and hairdressers fell in love with me. And here I am more than 38 years later, still in love with the beauty industry. Where was that when? In Provo, that Utah, believe it or not. And that's where I opened Utah. my first school as well. Uh, 35 years ago, my first school was in Provo, Utah. So I like to tell people, hey, if, if we made it work in Provo, Utah, what's wrong with you in your city? So you can make <laughs> it work anywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> And don't you hear that excuse all the time? Well, it's okay for you. You're in New York or you're in London, but you know, I'm in wherever. And it's not an excuse at all. No. <laughs> so thank you for endorsing that, Win. <laughs> what did you want to be when you were growing up? You know, I, I, I always knew, not sure why, but I always knew that I would work for myself. I always knew that I was not going to be a good employee that I, 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 I knew that I had a, a circle of influence and I had a skill set with that, I had a gift with that, and that I would use that to my advantage. Had no idea what that was going to be, but even from the time I was a little kid, um, I knew that I would be my own boss. Um, I always, I've always been attracted to uh, people who had power and influence, maybe even celebrity, but that they, they did good things with their celebrity. So it's not like I was attracted to a celebrity simply because they were famous or rich, because quite frankly, there's a lot of very famous rich people that I could care less what they have to say. Um, but when somebody <laughs> had celebrity and they had fame and then they did good things with that, I was always attracted to that so much so that I wanted to be that myself. Like my mom says that the way she got me to eat breakfast was to tell me that that's what Walt Disney ate for breakfast. And so of course, then, okay, well then I'm going to eat it. So I, I've always been attracted to, to, to mentors and to, to heroes, and I knew that that's what I wanted to become. I knew that I wanted to have a circle of influence that served people. 
Oh, and you have absolutely peaked in that. I mean, you know, the, the people that you motivate and you inspire, not just in our industry, but in tons of different industries. It's just incredible. I Thank love you. your story, Wim. I do too. I want you to, you know, you are a motivational speaker and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there are many students graduating now and in all schools, academies, they are graduating with a lot more skill level. They're almost graduating like they're two years out of a school already. Right. And what advice do you have to these to these individuals that are ready to bust out of the gate. And, you know, I, sometimes I worry that they, they're gonna go run too fast and then just fall and go, okay, I'm done. But what, yeah. could you, what word of advice could you just give to that beginning onset group that is about to enter this world? Well, first of all, let me, let me just say that I love this generation. Uh, because I feel like they are the catalyst for some wonderful changes that are happening on this planet. Uh, you know, people of, of my age, uh, the baby boomers were taught to believe that they'll have just one job, one career. Uh, so be it that your boss is a jerk. Oh, well, put up with it. That's just the way it is. And when you're done in 50 years, you'll get a beautiful watch on your retirement. And, <laughs> and, that's, and we just put up with that, you know, but now you have this generation that comes along that they, if the boss is a jerk, they're not going to put up with it. And why should they, you know, they, for, for them, family is important. We were taught to believe that we should sacrifice health, family, uh, everything to, to make money for a paycheck. And that was a good thing to do. And this generation comes along and they don't necessarily want to have that type of a, a career. They'll bounce around from one job to the next and they want to experiment with this and have this experience. And I, I think all of that's great because they do bring a catalyst or they are the catalyst of bringing wonderful positive change to the salon environment or to any environment. And so I, right. I, I love and I celebrate this generation, but I also feel that sometimes it can be the, the microwave generation, meaning they want things instantly. You know, they, they watch one YouTube video on on uh, makeup and they think that Warner Brothers should call them the next day to book them for a feature <laughs> film. You know, I, I like to say they, they hit one tennis ball and think that they're ready for Wimbledon. And so my advice, my advice would be to, you know, this is not a, this is not a race, you know, to, to, to slow down. Absolutely. You're going to get there and maybe you'll get there quicker than some of your mentors. Why? Because there is knowledge and, and resources available that maybe weren't available. 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so maybe you'll get there quicker, but it still takes a lot of work. Now, the good news is the work, the journey is fun. It's, a, it's an adventure. I, I heard it said that hairdressers go to work every single day with the intention of having fun. So un unlike your friends who chose other careers, not because it's what they love to do, but because somebody else wanted or, or expected them to do that. And so they now hate their lives Monday through Friday. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not us in the beauty industry. We, we get to love our lives every single day, but it still takes time. It still takes a lot of work. You still need to invest the time. People want that, that spotlight. And I like to tell them that, and I never want to take that away from somebody. I never want to say, well, you're never going to achieve that. That's not who I am. But sometimes they want that spotlight. Today, they want the spotlight of fame, of making money. And the truth of the matter is, if they got the spotlight today, they might make a total fool of themselves. Why? They're not ready. So just take your time. Make sure that you're ready. And it's not a race. Awesome. Absolutely. High five. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can I tell you, I, I got this email from uh, <coughs> one, of my, one of my students uh, who said that his goal is to become Britney Spears hairdresser. And I said to him, I said, okay, that's very specific. <laughs> you you want to be Britney Spears hairdresser. And I said to him, I said, I get it why you would choose Britney Spears. I get that. But would Britney choose you? See, I, I know Britney's hairdresser and he's, he's pretty incredible. And, and so I said to him, I said, are you better than, than George, you know, Britney's hairdresser? And if you're not better than George, why would Britney choose you? You right. want the spotlight, but you're not ready for that spotlight yet. Right, mm -hmm. right. Oh, and it can be so dangerous if we get it too soon. Yeah. Really do. So 
what's your greatest fear? Well, my greatest fear would probably be uh, related to being a dad. You know, you just, oh my gosh, when you become a dad, you, you just, you just, I just want to get it right. You know, so much, you know, pressure before when I made decisions, it's like if it, if it was the wrong decision and if I screwed up, well, I was the only one that was impacted by it. You know, when I was on the road for as much as I was on the road for 10, 20, 30 years, gone 80% of the time, nobody suffered in my absence. You know, I didn't have a fish, I didn't have plants, so nothing died while I was on the road all that time. And, and, <laughs> but, but now, you know, there's responsibility here. And so yeah. I guess if, if I have any fears, like, gosh, I just, I just want to be such a good dad and I, I, I don't want to screw that up. God bless you. And that she, was a good answer. Blessed to have you. <laughs> that was a good answer, young man, in more mm. ways than two. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, um, so you opened up a, a, a school, right? And then mm -hmm. from that, what were your takeaways from the first three years of you opening up a hair academy? Okay, now, uh, remember, I was not, didn't go to college, and I'm not a hairdresser. I've never been a hairdresser. So, uh, and, and again, because of my upbringing, I was always drawn to people who had uh, more experience, more knowledge than I have. I, yep. I, I'm not, I, I'm fine with not being the smartest person in a room. I'm not the smartest person in a room and I'm absolutely okay with that. So I've always looked to mentors. And so when I got into the beauty industry, I knew that I immediately needed some mentors, not a hairdresser, no college education, no business experience. I knew that I immediately needed some wonderful, incredible mentors. And so I sought them out. I, I like to say that I was a, a, a motivational speaker stalker. <laughs> I, I would stalk. <laughs> I would do my research and find out who are the most successful people back in those days. Remember Sam Bricado had just oh. come out with his book, Bus Beautiful Business. And so, of course, I literally, Sam will tell you the story. I literally showed up on his doorstep. Mm -hmm. I, I made a phone call and then literally he's like, he thought it was going to be one of those people where, you know, they ask for a favor and then you never hear from them again. And so, but not me, I, I show up at his doorstep and, and I did that with uh, Gene Bra, with Vivian McKinder, with Michael Cole. Uh, I mean, that list goes on and on. I sought out the best of the best of the best and then humbled myself enough to become their, their students. I, I, in many ways, admire that person that I was back then when I was such a good student. I love being a student and I, I try to get myself back into that mode because I don't know that you can be a really good teacher if you're not a really good student. Just like you can't be a good parent if you're not a good son. You know, I want to be a good son to my mom so that I can then turn around and be a good parent to my, to my daughter. So um, I, I'm not even sure if I answered your question, but I, I, I know that I spent the first several years of my career really, really doing my research. You know, that was my training. And, and that's never ended. I, I still, before I had this broadcast with you guys today, this podcast, uh, I was on the phone for an hour and a half with Melissa Yamaguchi, right? I, I just want to sit and learn. I want to humble myself and, and be that student to ask a ton, a ton of questions to learn from others. You know what's beautiful about that? When I first moved to, um, to the States, that was 20 years ago, um, coming from England, and probably Viv would share this with you as well, Wynn, that um, we would always be, feel very awkward to ask questions. So when I moved to the States, it was wonderful how people were just like, oh, you know, um, can you tell me this or can you tell me that? No one was afraid to ask questions. And mm. I really envy the students that are trained in the United States states for that reason because you learn so much quicker it's it's a, um, it's a great quality to have it's a good practice to have you know i mean cool that you can stand around at some business function at salon industry function and brag about all the things that you're so good at but what don't you know like that let's talk yeah. about that so for if we all got together and said you know i really suck in this area you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really inexperienced in this area Give me that list because that's the list that's going to take us to the next level. What don't yeah. you know? Let's talk about what you don't know. So true. So true. Woo. So is it, what single thing would improve the quality of your life? 
Hmm. You know, I've, I've always had this, this uh, attitude of um, that, that I'm never going to graduate. So I, I'm not done with anything yet. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not done with my learning. I'm not done with uh, my income level. I'm not done with starting new businesses and opportunities. And so uh, just, just I, I like the idea of uh, I'm never going to graduate from anything. And so just with that attitude, it propels me through life, especially becoming a, a father. I'm 61 years old with an eight-year-old daughter. So um, I'm, I'm doing all of this kind of later in life. And, um, and, and I'm 61, and I already forgot your question. So <laughs> <laughs> I know that. That's, that's, that's <laughs> twice I've done that. So I better start writing these things you down. You know what? Got, I, I think got pen and paper now. What single thing would improve the quality of your life? And, you know, and it, I love your answer. You know, your ongoing answer. knowledge. I just want to keep growing. I just want to keep moving forward. I, I, I'm going to be 70 when my daughter graduates from high school. So I, you know, I need a lot of energy here. So I, 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 I got, I got to stay as young as I possibly can, both physically, mentally, and in every other area as well. Mm. Yeah, I think and you it's got a great work. start there, young man. You yeah. know, you just keep doing what you're doing. Don't put a number on it, right? We all say that. But, you know, you're fascinating. And you, you're, you have a very, uh, I mean, I, I would like to ask from a motivational speaking standpoint, when was the first time, because I don't know if it was at a hair conference or not, or at a other type of business conference, but where do you feel, where was the first time that you were actually brought in as a motivational speaker to motivate a very large audience. Do you remember or yeah, not? I, I, I do. There's a, a little bit of a story that I can tell if you don't mind. No, um, share it. Okay, so I, I, and this is like in the mid 80s. So now granted, I was already a salon owner and I was a school owner. So I had employees and I had students, but I couldn't even get myself out of bed. I mean, I was, I was that miserable, that depressed, and so I knew that I needed to find some answers. And a friend of mine one day uh, handed me a cassette tape. You know, it was that long ago. It was a cassette tape of a motivational speaker. Now, I didn't even know that there was such thing as motivational speakers. I had never even heard of that concept that there's somebody who could, with their words, get you on a better path. And so he just handed me this cassette and said, you know, Wynn, why don't you take a, li a, a listen to this? Now, First of all, he, he didn't beat me over the head with it. He didn't say, you know, when you're a big old loser, I think you really need to listen to this. He just lovingly and kindly handed it to me and said, you know, why don't you take a listen to this? Well, I listened to that tape and I bet I listened to it. I'm not exaggerating a hundred times. I wore it out. I could quote you to this day. It was a, a, a speaker by the name of Ed Foreman. I could tell you today exactly what he said, what he, what he talked about, but that really changed my life. And that put me on this journey of seeking out other mentors, other motivational speakers. And back then it was like Louise Hay, Marianne Williamson, Og Mandino, Gerald Jampolsky, John Bradshaw, this very long list of incredible speakers, both from a, from a clinical point of view to a, um, a spiritual point of view to a business point of view. I was attacking it from all angles because... Um, I was desperate. Not, I, it, this wasn't through inspiration. This was from desperation. I needed this information. I was taking in so much information back then that the only way that I could validate the information was to talk about it. And so I would come home from a two-day retreat and in staff meeting for my salon. They'd say, well, gosh, what did you learn in the last two days? And rather than talking about the business of the salon, I would try to repeat everything that I learned at that retreat. And this process of sharing information eventually turned into a career. I was so passionate about sharing with people, not teaching people, because I don't feel like I, I can teach anybody anything. My, my goal is just to share information. If we were all honest with each other at a party, we find out that we're all going through the same stuff. And so it was just me sharing my story. I love that. What is the worst thing that anyone has ever said to you? Uh, probably the worst thing would be that, um, you know, people can't change. You know, I'm, I'm always amazed that, you know, and, and they've said that in reference to me, 
and they say that in reference to other people, you know, that, that belief system that people can't change. And my gosh, if that's, if that's true, well, then I should still be a drug addict. If, if that's true, then what's the point of this podcast today? What's the, what's the point of any kind of training or education? Or what's the point of going to church if, if people can't change? If, what's the point of meditation? And so I just think that for people to have that belief system, not only is limiting to other people, uh, they're, they're limiting themselves. Yeah, probably where it comes from as well. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you were, you were um, I don't know if you know who said this about you, but I'm going to test you right now. I'm going to read something that says, um, one has to admire when he seems to spend his life uplifting our craft and everyone else's as well. Vidal says soon. Vidal said that? Said that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> I have one more for you because then you're going to tell me if you've ever met this person. Okay. Um, Wynn is a remarkable guy and one of the best motivational speakers in the entire country. Larry King. Hmm. Do you want to no. talk to us a little bit about this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, a long, long time ago, Mass, uh, Modern Salon Magazine did a, a story about me and they, they called me the Larry King of the beauty industry because I've been doing master's podcasts. You know, Chris, I featured you, I don't know how many years ago. I've, I've been doing that for 21 years. So even before there was a thing called podcast, I was sitting down and recording people. And, uh, and uh, Vidal Sassoon, by the way, was one of the first people that I interviewed. But anyway, so Modern Salon Magazine did this story on me calling me the Larry King of the beauty industry. And somehow Larry read that, he saw that, and he called me and said, I, I want you to come to the house so I can teach you how to be Larry King. So that's how that all started. Oh, you kidding? No, so I went to his house and he sat down with me and he said, this is how you interview people. This is how you get the best story. This is how you interject. This is when you need to hold back. Um, and it was, it was incredible, incredible training. What a great guy. And then when I um, was writing my book, uh, he mentioned that as well. He said, hey, if you're writing this book, I would like to put my name in the book and, and uh, do the, the foreword for the book. Um, actually, and back then, the book was called Just Be Nice. It was Be Nice. And he said, I want you to add the uh, Be Nice or Else. That, that's my Larry King imitation right there. <laughs> be Nice or Else. Yeah. That's he, he added the or else part. And by the way, now people think that the or else is something like negative, like it's a threat. No. It's be nice or live a miserable life. Be nice or be a horrible parent. That's what that means. Be nice or else. And it's absolutely a wonderful book. So whoever is tuned in with us, the title is Be Nice or Else. Mm -hmm. And it's by Wing Claybar. And it's available on Amazon, is it? Wing? It is. It, it is or through my website, wingclaybar.com. Okay. That's important to say. That's Thank important you. to say. Okay. Yeah, it's a I, wonderful, wonderful book. I want to know, you've met lots of people. And uh, as, a, as one that um, has also met a numerous amount of icons, and I'm now, it's weird to think that I'm up into that area as well. But if I go back to when I graduated in 1980, <clears throat> one of the people that were fascinating to see, as you know, because there was no YouTube. So you waited all year long to see typically your, your, your mentor. And I believe that Paul Mitchell was fascinating. And how close were you to him in his life? And how much did he inspire you to be where you are today? You know what? I was not close at all. I never met the man in person. I never did. In fact, he died in 1989. And that was the, after he died, soon after he died was the first time that the Paul Mitchell company hired me as, as a speaker. Uh, however, I am, I am very close with his friend. I'm, I'm sorry, with his son, Angus. I was just on the phone with Angus uh, 30 minutes ago before we started this uh, podcast. So I'm, I'm really close. I, I feel like I get the best of, of Paul through his son, uh, Angus. I also, so cool. through the, 
his belief system, Paul, the man, Paul Mitchell, had a dream of being in the school of business one day. That he, he talked about that. I have recordings of him talking about his desire and his plan to really elevate the entire beauty industry by starting uh, with the, the, the very beginners, brand new people entering the beauty industry. That was a passion of his. And so for me to be a part of helping him live out that, that dream of his was really a, a, quite the uh, experience for me to have that opportunity. He was an icon we missed. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and so is his son. And by the way, I first met Angus when he was probably about five years old. <laughs> and, uh, so please give him my love next time. You I absolutely him. will. It's a long time since I've seen him. He's a good man. Oh, yeah. He yeah. Is. He's been through a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot. Um, when, what do you feel that you owe to your parents? Hmm. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, my, there's eight kids in my family, and, and uh, so a lot of kids in one little house, and so we never had our own bedrooms. So we, just because of the demographics uh, in the house, we had to learn how to get along with each other. So my parents really taught us that. My parents taught us a, a work ethic. I always ask my mom, how did you raise eight kids? And she's like, well, I would just teach the next one how to do everything so that by the time I got down to number four, number five, number six, you know, they could do it for the, for the other ones. And so growing <laughs> up, we, I know, I, I can barely do it with one, right? So she, we all knew how to cook. We all knew how to sew. We all knew how to paint. We all knew how to change tires. We all knew how to balance our checkbooks. We all knew how to do everything. And so my parents taught us a, a great work ethic. I, I had my first jobs, you know, it was a paper boy, but you know, that 12 years old. And I think I had three paper routes, you know, so I was, you know, out on my bicycle at night. Can you imagine? I can't imagine my daughter out there on her bicycle by herself at night, but uh, you know, that's what we did. And so I got a really good work ethic and that still serves me to this day. You know, I, like I said, I'm not the smartest person in a room, but I can work really, 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 really hard. And nobody can ever take that away from me. We have to work really, really hard. I got that from my parents. I also, for my, and I, I, I mentioned this on my, my social media yesterday because it was Father's Day in honor of my father. My father could never talk about his family, his wife, his kids, his grandkids without getting emotional. He would just, like, he would just, mm, and mm, <laughs> here I am emotional <laughs> talking about my dad, talking about his family. And so I obviously inherited that trait from my father, which I, which I love. Family was always number one. Um, we, we all, no matter how far off track we got in his eyes, we always knew. I always knew that, that I would be loved and accepted and supported by my parents. And that's, that's a good feeling because I had friends who had the opposite experience, that if they got off track this much, mom and dad were going to abandon them. They were no longer welcomed. And I just can't imagine ever um, sending out that message to your kids. And so I, but I learned that from my father and from my mom. And also I learned uh, about philanthropy, the importance of giving back. You know, why do I have to go mow the lawn of the old lady down the street, especially if she's not gonna pay me? Well, because you, we serve people here. That's what we do. We serve, we take care of people. Uh, and by the way, you're gonna do it when she's not looking and nobody will know that it's you that mowed her lawn. But that doesn't make sense to me, dad. So, you know, I, I, got, I got that really good work ethic from them as well as the importance of whatever your job is that there there has to be a part of your um a part of your career that is in is in service you know what do they say that uh service is the rent that we pay for room on this earth uh so we're, we're all taking up space here and so to pay for the space that we take up we have to pay rent and how we pay that rent is by giving back to others. And I learned that from my parents. Woo. What an incredible story. Glad we got that recorded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did your father do when? What was My father job? was an engineer. My father was an engineer. My mom, obviously, she was, a, she was a, a, a taking care of eight kids at home. But she always had something else going on, on the side. So she was always... You know, working, uh, whether it was managing all the paper boys, you know, so they'd all come to our house to, to start their routes. Um, and actually, I, I got my mother to uh, quit her job and come to work for me like 35 years ago. So she had this, 
She was a career woman. She had this wonderful job. And I somehow, after only one year of business, talked her into quitting that job and coming to work for me. And it was great because I got to have a relationship with my mom that some of my siblings did not get to have. They only knew mom as mom, which was a great woman. She was an incredible mom. But I got to see my mother as this amazing, nurturing businesswoman, which, you know, for leadership, if you're a leader that is not uh, compassionate, does not have empathy, you're not going to be a good, strong leader for very long. And I, I learned that from my mom. Can I tell you something kind of funny? So um, last year in 2019, my mom calls me. She leaves me this message, you know, when I really need to talk to you. Well, she never does that. I'm like, I'm like oh my gosh, what's going on? Right? So I call mom, mom, what's up? What's up? You know, I've been thinking about this and um, I just think it's time for me to retire. <laughs> She's 92. Okay, mom, you can retire. You're, you're allowed, mom. It's time for mom to retire. So after 38 years of working with me, my mom retired last year. Wow. Dang it. Oh, wow. is she doing well? She's doing great. We were just there. We had our little road trip, drove up to Utah to spend some time with her. She's 93 now and, you know, going strong and just, you know, uh, just this kind hearted woman. Just, um, I've never heard her speak ill of anybody uh, still always has projects going on so her mind is is alert and and always active and I I, I just I, I love that that's the mom that I have and I know other people don't have that 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 wonderful experience that I have but I'm grateful to know that I've been able to share that experience uh, with with others some of the best stories that I tell from the stage are about my mom and about my, my mom and dad and their marriage. And some of those stories are the funniest stories, but also the stories that people love to hear the most. Give us one. You know, my, uh, so, so um, my parents came to visit. Uh, I lived in Southern California, so I'm taking them back to the airport, right? LAX, which is a very, very busy airport. So, you know, here, there, there's the curb where you, you pull up and you, you, you get your passengers and their luggage out under the curb, right? Uh, well, cars will park like two or three cars deep because it's a very busy airport. So I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, three or four cars deep uh, trying to get my parents out of the car with their, lecture, with their luggage. Uh, you know, open the door for my dad. Here, dad, let me help you out of the car. No, son, I can do this on my own. Okay, dad. You know, very independent, but <laughs> takes forever. <laughs> oh, okay, dad. Well, then I'm going to help mom out of the car. No, son. That is my sweetheart. I help your mother out of the car. <gasps> okay, dad. So, um, takes forever, by the way. So I get their <laughs> luggage, their luggage is on the curb. Now I'm blocking like five other cars who can't leave because this is all happening, right? So I'm, they're out of their cars. They're hanging out with me at the back of my car. And I'm like, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And this woman is like, are you kidding? This is so romantic. Oh. I'm like, okay. <laughs> there, there's my parents teaching about romance at LAX. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. oh, I love that story. I love it. Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> that's cute. So what do you think? Will your eight-year-old daughter, as she's growing up, inspire you to motivate in writing some type of a book that could be beneficial as far as how people view other people and the world? Absolutely. I, I, I am working on a children's version of, of Be Nice. Um, oh, you know, fortunately, my daughter is, is at a school where they are hypersensitive about uh, about bullying and, you know, but just to know how prominent that is. Um, and, and I have connected myself with this woman, Dr. Swear from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, who's like one of the leading experts on that topic. Anytime that there's a news story, you know, she's the first person that they call to get her commentary on, on bullying. She's this amazing, incredible woman. And so along with her input and, and of course having a little daughter uh, you, you better believe that I, I want to teach uh, kindness and who better than to teach it through a powerful little girl who absolutely already has a voice. Um, she is really into her causes. She's really into animal health and rescue and she's raised money and started her own little foundation and stuff. And, and so because she was passionate about that, she's raised money for 
Best Friends Animal Society. And so her, along with two of her little friends, uh, stood on stage at one of our big events, you know, 300 leaders in the audience. And the, those three little girls <laughs> held their own. I mean, my gosh, this little girl has a voice. And so to be able to use my influence uh, to through her, through her little powerful voice, I just know that that's going to go so far. Wow. I can't wait to see that children's book. Yeah, me too. I would love to get that. So you must post Oh, sorry, really quickly. She just see, this is what when we have when we have home studios, this is what happens. They they pop in to say hi. So this is this is Sophia, everybody. Hello say there, hi. Sophia. Sophia. How are you? She's good. She can't she can't hear because I got a little ear thing here, but oh. Uh, oh, okay. But okay. I love you. Okay, okay. Bye, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> Bye, darling. Oh my gosh, the best You're thing adorable. ever. Adorable. Yeah, that's I wonder, great. I wonder what she'll be when she grows up. Oh, Probably are you kidding? Like like you when a motivational speaker. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, She's I think cool. everybody should be a motivational speaker. I I really do. I I think that everybody should have that skill set, no matter what it is that you, if you're a hairdresser, to be able to know how to use your words and your emotions to, to draw people in. If you're a salon owner or any kind of a, a business leader, to be able to have that skill set to, with your words and your emotion, you can move somebody one-on-one -on -one or an, uh, a team of 10 people or an audience of thousands of people. I think that it serves anybody and everybody to have that skill set of being a motivational speaker. So yes, she's gonna be a motivational speaker and who knows what else. Right. When, when did you realize, uh, or when did you uh, bring up the courage to, to be able to step on a stage and do what you perhaps weren't 100% sure that you could do? I'm still not 100% <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I'll, it, 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 it really does. It still, to this day, it, it, it scares me to death. You know, they, they say the number one fear is public speaking. Well, the number two fear is death by fire. So, you know, you know how I feel when I walk out onto a stage. But, you know, what, what do they say? That courage is that you have the fear and you do it anyway. I, yeah. I, know, I know it's good for me because I know. And I had this experience where I took a, like a six-month period off of, of work from standing on a stage. I was still working, but I wasn't standing on a stage. And during those six months... I noticed that I became um, uh, a, a little, a, a bit negative. I, I, I was short tempered. Um, I wasn't as easy going with my team members, right? Like I noticed that it, it, it didn't bring out the best in me to not stand on a stage. So I, I know that I will always need to do that. I will always need to stand on a stage and share my stories and share my passion because it makes me a better human being. The same as some of the other good habits that I have in my life, like eating well and going to the gym. You know, those are good habits that serve me well. I know that it serves me well. Some people say it's, it's if they don't do their artwork or they don't practice their music or they don't, you know, knit or do photography, whatever it is that brings them joy and passion. Uh, if they don't do those things, then it affects the other areas of their lives. That's how it is for me with, uh, with the speaking. There's just something about sharing stories that where I can engage an audience. Sometimes it's an audience of total strangers, but in that hour long period of time, I can be so vulnerable with them. I can, sh I can be so authentic with them that it gives that room full of people permission to then come up to me and share some of the most intimate stories. And I just love that exchange. And so I, I don't think that I'll ever give that up. Mm, bless you. And I, I totally know, know what you're saying. Yeah. I do too. I do too. I, you know, you've done so much. And, you know, it goes without saying that gratitude, yes. And you have a gift. And I would like to ask you the question of this. 50 years from now, there's a time capsule that's found, and your name is written in it. And what would you like it to say that greatly describes either, either a footprint that you have left in this industry or 
you know, a title of what, what it was that you were all about. Like, what do you want, what do you want the, the, the new student to know the most about you that you've left behind? Not that you're leaving very quickly because you're going to be around for another hundred years, but I'm just saying, Meg, what would be in that time capsule that would have Wynn's name on it? Um, well, number one is that, that I'm a good dad. Um, I just, I just don't believe that any amount of success outside of the home could compensate for failure at home. So I just know that doesn't matter how much money I make, doesn't matter how famous I become, doesn't matter what else I put out there. If on any level I'm a failure in my home with my, my little family and especially with my little daughter that nothing else will, will make much of a difference. And so, you know, I, I want to be a good dad, but I also know that being a good dad means that, that I'm doing things with my celebrity, with my circle of influence, with my power, I'm doing good things that make a difference on this planet. So I'm not retiring and focusing only on being a room parent for her classroom. There's a lot, sure. which, by the way, I am. I want you to know I am a room parent for her classroom four years in a row, by the way. Oh, get this, out of all the room parents in the school, it's, I'm the only dad, it's me and a bunch of moms. Makes me wanna start drinking again, by the way. Um, so yeah, I, I do want to do those things. I want to be active in her in her life, but I also know that what makes me a better person and therefore a better dad is that I have all this other stuff going on as well. And I, in my career right now, I've been doing this for so long and have such an incredible team of people that work with me. You know, you don't want me working in the financial aid department of my company. You don't want me doing payroll. You know, you don't even want me to water the plants because they'll all be dead in about two weeks. So there's there's things that I'm just not really good at. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. And so I, I have the luxury in my career at this point to where probably a good 70% of my time is spent on the philanthropy side of, of, of Paul Mitchell schools. And so I get to put a lot of time, a lot of energy into uh, the causes that we support. I feel, I feel very, very fortunate that I'm alive during this period of time where there's so much uh, social injustice is happening and that man was privileged and I have so much to learn. I have so much to learn and I feel grateful that, okay, um, maybe, I, maybe I didn't do enough when, when the whole Rodney King thing happened that many years ago, but I can, I can do something today. I'm, I'm, I'm a better person. What does Maya Angelou says that when you know better, you'll do better. And so I do know better and therefore I'm required to, to, to do better. I know better. So I'm going to do better. And I, I want to be a part of that change. I, I want to be a part of the, 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 the group that doesn't feel like we have the answers because I don't have the answers. I want to be a really good student right now. I just want to sit and I want to listen and so those are the things that 50 years from now, I want to be proud of that. Yeah, during, during the, the unrest that I was part of that solution, that while we were uh, quarantined during COVID, that I didn't lay by the wayside and, and get fat and lazy. And, but instead, I, I, I chose to come out of that experience stronger and better than when we all went in. And so if those are the things... I guess I'm looking for um, challenges in life, things that come up that are going to make me a better, stronger person, things that challenge me. Um, I'm, I'm, I would never wish um, an addiction on to somebody, but the fact that I went through that myself, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful yeah. that I had that experience because it made me a better <clears throat> person. It made me more approachable. And so... Maybe I, I'm the type of person that needs to go through uh, certain challenges, and opportunity to step up and be a better person. Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. When um, my belief too is that unless you've experienced something, you're not qualified to speak about it, you know, from an authentic place. And uh, yeah, many of us go through interesting things in our lives that make us hopefully better people. We need, we need to honor those experiences. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're certainly honoring the experience and having Wing Claybar 
on, on Iconics with us. And we are so grateful for you being so gracious and, and joining us and believing in us. And most of all, I, I thank you for being my friend. You know, well, it's so easy to do. First of all, Chris, I'm never going to say no to you. Um, but I, I don't want to <laughs> say no to anything. You know, when I, I, I had no audience, I didn't have one subscriber. But when I asked Vidal Sassoon 22 years ago, hey, can I interview you for this new idea that I have? He said yes. So what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now turn around and say no? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to say yes every single time. Cool, because we might be wanting you back again. <laughs> I, ho I certainly I, hope so. <clears throat> I and certainly think so. <laughs> I think so. Plus, we still have lunch to do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You're going you're gonna to mail a sandwich to me. I got yeah. it. Yeah. We got to get that out of the way. Can you mail me a key lime pie instead? I like key lime pie. How about that? <laughs> Your Lord have mercy. Shrink wrap so it won't like, get all smushed. Yeah, I won't, you know I won't tell you one from the UK win because they have no idea what even what they okay. are. <laughs> oh, you it know, was so wonderful. Yeah, it was it was great talking to you. And all I can think of is where Win goes next. Like what's in the next couple of years for Win C, you know? Um and obviously we know you're in the works of a book. Mm-hmm. And I would like to get that book a little bit more promoted. So um, I'm going to make sure that Julie and Cassie, we get that book on our Iconics mm -hmm. so that more see it, you know, and know where they can get it and take, and take it to your website. If, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. You know? I mean, we know you have a choice of people to hang around. So our relationship is just starting, but you know, <laughs> You didn't say no to Chris. So you know that you guys have a, you have a platform and 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 the, and you're using this platform to uh, send out a great message to 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 mentor and my gosh this is this is incredible. So I I I, I applaud you guys because um, I, I really doubt that somebody's paying you. I don't I don't think that you answered an ad in the classified section or in the business section. <laughs> hey, we're looking for somebody to to lead a podcast. You know what? You just uh, we, we still hustle, right? That for me, the phone yeah. does not ring. The phone yeah. never rings. We make these things happen for ourselves. Yeah, we really, really do. And yeah. I, I think it's, I think we're, it's, it's just turning out great. And you really started it when you think about it, right? Because you did it without video. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, and to this day, it's still audio. I, I got interviewed it, a couple of weeks ago and the, the woman interviewed me, told me that she had just interviewed Katie Couric the day before, and Katie Couric told her, if we turn off our cameras, we'll get a better interview. I'm like, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, you know, so, I, I always think that. It's that, sorry uh, to up to you, Wim, but send us the link to Masters as well so that we can put that on the- Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. That yeah. Would be beautiful. And when I don't know if you know this fabulous, uh, strong cool hip woman um but do you know sherry das i don't think i do have you ever had the opportunity of meeting this individual um she's on iconics next week and Wonderful. she's got she's got quite a story as well and um chris what's her position right now actually she's the vice president of education for globally for redkin dang so, that's a title I mean, yeah, oh, it's it's a title and a half. Wow. And this lady is absolutely incredible. She's a dynamo. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that her job has been hugely affected with this lockdown and everything because she didn't spend five minutes at home. So I think she's probably quite enjoyed it with that. Oh, I'm sure. L'Oreal. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, you know what? We're, we're learning things going through this pandemic and being quarantined. Uh, there are things that are going to serve us so well, right? Like distance learning is never going to go away. The fact that we all know, wait, we can do this. This is great. Oh my gosh. The fact that we're able to gather like this, this is an incredible, incredible uh, new resource that we're all going to draw from and we're going to be better because of this experience. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Very well said. I wanted you to say something about that. 
you know, how you see the, the whole surrounding. Cause I really do. I mean, unfortunately people are dying, but you know, there, there is something to be said about this next generation of education and, um, man, just when I wanted to buy in a Zoom, they shut it down for stacks. <laughs> there you <Yeah>. go. <laughs> but anyway, I think that, um, you know, I am, I am pleased with uh, having spent this time with you, Win, And I, I do believe that from what I see, um, we are contacted through the week. I certainly am with my connections out on others that want to get involved. But if you, young man, were ever able to truly just interview someone that you haven't yet interviewed, who would that be? Wow. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the platform that I have because that's the best way to meet somebody is, hi, you don't know who I am, but I want to interview you. It's yeah. A great, it's a great opening line, by the way. And, 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 and in 22 do you years mind of if doing I use this, that? do you mind no, if please I use do. that? Well, you know, nobody's ever turned me down. Nobody's ever said no. So I, I have met the most famous, talented, incredible people. I, I, I interviewed Gary Sinise, you know, Lieutenant Dan from, from, um, uh, oh, what's the, the movie? Oh, I can't remember the movie either. Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump. Yeah. Oh, called Gary, can I interview you? Cause he's a nice, nice, nice celebrity who does incredible things for veterans and first responders. And I wanted to share his story and, and spread the good works that he does. So I contacted him and he said, yes. I mean, how else can you meet somebody other than say, hey, I want to interview you. I can't date them, but I can, <laughs> can I interview you? So it's a great opening line. So, you know, I, I, and, but I, I, to answer your question, I don't know that I have the answer, but I do know that I have a very, very lengthy list. I have this planner that is with me at all times. And um, at, look, this is the, this, so this, this is the list of people I have not interviewed yet. This is on my wish list. So I'm always, ah. I'm always, always, always on the hunt. And usually oh. the people that I want to interview are people who have been through something in life. They've, they've been through something horrific or something really challenging. You know, Cedric King, who lost both of his legs by stepping on a bomb in Afghanistan. I want to, I want to hear your story, right? And I asked him at the end of that, I said, hey, if you could go back and change that day when you stepped on that bomb, meaning erase that day, would you? What was his answer? Of course not. He said, I was a jerk before that happened to me. Losing my legs made me a better person, a better dad, a better husband. Why would I ever want to go back and change that day? So I'm looking for people who have stories like that because that, that keeps me on track. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fabulous. And I've learned actually quite a bit from listening to you today. And I want to thank you very much for your time again. And um, Chris, is there anything that you'd like to say to Win in closing? Win. We're coming back to see you because I think you're fascinating. And thank you. Um, I really think that you're not going anywhere yet. So we're going to keep bothering you. Mm -hmm. If that's okay. Absolutely. Suddenly we're friends. <laughs> Wait, I just want to say I love you and thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. You guys, thanks. Thanks for including me. When I saw the list of other people that you've already interviewed, I was like, okay, a little bit of pressure. <laughs> um, but uh, just so so humbled and grateful to be no, a part of your yeah, list. Yeah, God, we feel the same. And for mm -hmm. everybody watching right now, just always make sure that you know that in our YouTube channel, Iconics, you can see all the other uh, icons that we have documented so far. And we're growing. Um, we've got two quite the list of icons that are coming up in the future. And it's you know every Monday. So just keep uh, Instagramming. Instagram is I C O N I X X dot X and Facebook. Go. go ahead and spell it out. But mm -hmm. from this day forth, we say we love you from Chris Sorby and myself and Win. thank you again. Peace, love and hair gel, whether you have hair or not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that.